Welcome to our fifth Recovering Through Grief podcast on February 24th, 2023. We have a beautiful speaker again today who I will introduce shortly. When death comes in the form of suicide, another more complicated grief is encountered. Bewildered, shocked, angry, betrayed and abandoned, every wild and unsettled emotion courses through one's body as a griever tries to make sense of the senseless. The griever is left dazed. For the ones who lose someone to suicide, the ground beneath them feels as though it is turning into quicksand. Choosing to end end one's life feels hopeless to digest. Isn't the adage that we are supposed to say yes to life? Yet so many of us are touched by suicide and or suicidal thoughts. There are many reasons for the occurrence of suicide. Those reasons do not settle the heart of the ones left to struggle within the sorrow that prevails. Ancestral grief, the grief we carry in our bodies from sorrows experienced from previous lifetimes and by our ancestors can actually play a deeper role than we would have considered within the ideology of suicide. For some some ancestral and previous incarnations grief can appear as a sadness that is difficult to identify. For these individuals, this can manifest as a great tear tear in their psychic foundation. This grief can be so pronounced that it can be hard to reconcile. For certain ones, this sequestered pain generates a persistent hum of sorrow in the background of their lives. It is also worth noting how suicide can arise as a seeming remedy when the integrity of the body has been violated and one's essential wholeness is lost. In this fifth Recovering Through Grief episode in which loss, wounds, and disappointments contributed to suicide, and as we go along in this interview, we may find that it it was something far different than a suicide. We additionally hope to explore the premise that grief is a powerful solvent, capable of softening the hardest of places in our heart. Grief by its very nature confirms worth. I am worth crying over. My losses matter. To feel valued for the gifts with which we are born affirms our worth and dignity. Grief has a way of restoring those buried attributes. We are being called to treat grief as worthy of attention and welcome its inherent gifts and common bond. Our guest speaker today is Stephanie Massengale. Her bio exemplifies the plethora of wisdom and gifts Stephanie brings to the table. In a style similar to Esther Hicks with Abraham, Stephanie Massengale channels a loving fifth dimensional being named Aria from the Arcturus star system. Aria is knowledgeable on a variety of topics and you can ask her any question. She is here at this point in history to help humanity with the evolution of consciousness. Stephanie is her channeler and is also a medium, intuitive life coach, hypnotherapist and Reiki master. Stephanie has been trained by many well-known speakers in the field of metaphysics, including Tony Stockwell, Michael Beckwith, Dan Millman, David Hawkins, David Wolf, Sonia Choquette, Lindsay Wagner, and Tony Robbins. Stephanie is also a oneness blessing facilitator and Akashic Records reader and has 15 years experience in metaphysics. She has had two near-death experiences and has done more than 12,000 readings. To learn more about Stephanie, you can visit her website at www.intuitivewisdomtoday.com. I would also like to share William's bio. William is the son that Stephanie lost to what she believed was suicide, and I would like to share Uh, more more about his bio and background so you can get a better taste of who he was as a wonderful human being. William Christopher Massengale died at age 25 as a result of complications from a brain injury. William accomplished many beautiful things in his short life 
including being a great friend, son, and brother to those whom he knew. He was the writer and creator of the YouTube channel Video Insights. He was an actor for two years in historical films about Gettysburg, as well as a regular extra on the TV show Turn that was all about the American Revolution. He was a resident of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and was the after-school director for their Waldorf School in Chapel Hill. He was a philosopher who followed Stoicism and the works of Alan Watts, Jordan Peterson, and Douglas Murray. He was an artist and shared art essays on his YouTube channel. He believed everyone should have a friend, and William's philosophy was to love everyone. If you would have liked to, admit, to meet William, all you have to do is watch the body of work he created on his YouTube channel, Video Insights. One of the topics we are going to explore today is that William did not die of suicide. He died from lack of sleep and a brain injury. He did not choose suicide, though many people do. His brain collapsed. Suicide was a result, not the cause. It takes courage and conviction to continue after the suicide of a loved one. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for your bravery in sharing your story with us today. How are you today, Stephanie? Today is my 60th birthday. It so is. Happy birthday. birthday. I'm so Thank excited you. for you. Thank you so uh -huh. much for taking your time to be here today with, with your birthday. Absolutely. And, and when you offered it, I thought it was just so apropos that it happened on my 60th birthday. How could I say no? Oh, I'm so grateful, and I'm, so, I'm I'm happy for William. I think he would have enjoyed be, being able to participate in a birthday celebration, so this is a beautiful way for him to do that. Exactly. My first question is going to be, if you can, within your comfort level, if you can share your story of William's passing. All right, so <clears throat> you want me to start with, like, when I first found out, or, or, or his conditions that led into it, like, how would you let's like first it? let's first do what what when you first found out yes so um so he died on january 27th of 2021 and i was helping my oldest son matthew do some college lessons and and so uh there was a knock on the door from a police officer and he said there's an ongoing incident with william and uh when i know more i'll let you know and then he left and i asked him some questions trying to get more out of him and I was scant because I'm a psychic and a medium and I was scanning the energy and I knew in that moment he was gone I knew he had died and I didn't know the details but I could tell that he wasn't he wasn't there um and so uh maybe an hour went by and the police officers came back there were four of them this time there were four people and in the meantime I called um my, my middle son and and we, we were trying to figure out, and people were trying to call William's phone. And his girlfriend had also, when she realized he was missing that morning, and she knew that he had a gun, I didn't know he had a gun, um, she called the police to try to find him. And so, uh, uh, so when the police came back out um, the second time, and I was on the phone with my ex-husband at the time, and... I said, there's four people coming up the stairs. And, and he said he knew what that meant. He said then he knew he was gone. And uh, so, you know, that's a moment that is very surreal. And I think for, for most, and what's interesting for me is this is my, not the first person in my family to commit suicide. So I've, I've been down this road before. But as a medium and as a psychic, I have sat with hundreds of people of families of suicide and so you know i had a lot of training to kind of back me up but i certainly never imagined you know and william was so loving and there were really very few warning signs and so maybe one or two i mean for other people there were more signs but william kept that away from me because he didn't want to upset me i'm sure um and so you know that began a very strange and bizarre day you know and uh 
it, 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 I went into shock. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, there's a lot. I remember a lot about the first day, but I have very little memory from day one to day 10. Wow. And then day 10, I guess I'll go ahead and throw this in here now, was, so if, if someone asked me, what do I need to know when a loved one has died? What, what like words of wisdom would you tell them? The two most important things I would tell that person is get sleep no matter what and do not drive your car. And in my case, because William had a sleep disorder, I decided that I was, as a medium, well, first of all, I have to back up. So as a medium, he, the first few hours after someone dies, they're in what I've always referred to as the shimmer. And it is dangerous for me for the first 24 hours to go into the energy of someone who's just died. And as a mother, I was going to go after William. And so... You know, Aria, the, the loving being that I channel, she's like, you have to make 40 hours without falling asleep. And so I made it 40 hours without sleeping because she's like, you got to stay up as long as you can so that I didn't go after him and then have trouble getting back in my own body. You get what I'm saying? Like, does that make sense? Yes. And so because William could stay up for days at a time and then sleep for days at a time as a side effect of his brain injury... When I hit that 40 hour mark, I did something kind of stupid, you know, in hindsight. At the time, it made total sense because you're in grief and, you know, you think, you know, you, you, and you're in shock. So you're not really paying attention. And I knew, I said, I'll never again know what it's like to be William. I'll never again have this opportunity to stay up for as long as I can. And it's interesting, two other family members did the same thing. <clears throat> they stayed up as well. Uh, independently, we, neither of us said, none of us said that. And, I stayed up for four days and I stayed wow. up. I only slept 12 hours in four days, which was stupid in retrospect. Um, and so then 10 days out, uh, I have autoimmune issues and I can't get really cold and it was winter and there was a huge storm coming. And I said, okay, I got to get out ahead of the storm. So I said, okay, let me get out ahead of the storm. And when I got down to Florida, because I was running low on sleep and I was disoriented, um, I ended up lost in the neighborhood at night and I parked my car and I said, well, I'll sit on the ground and I'll get grounded and then I'll be grounded. Right. And, and it was cold. It was going to be cold that night in Florida. And I blacked out and I woke up a day and a half later in the hospital and someone had fit, had notified and they said, we think there's a woman unconscious next to her car. Uh, but I wasn't found for a while. I mean, it was probably, you know, I don't know, anywhere from 10 to 20 hours before they found me. Wow. And then what happened after that? I spent five days in the hospital and then um, I had hypothermia because I'd gotten too cold. So my hands and my feet and my lips were blue. And so at the end of the five day period, when I got released from the hospital, one of my friends, Eileen, she came and got me and she lived local from where I was. I was in St. Augustine and she lived up in Jack's. And she took one look at me when she picked me out of the hospital with my blue lips. And my brain was slow from everything. And she called my family and everybody. And she said, she's staying with me for a month. End of story. She's recovering here. We'll run everything from here. And yeah. so that was a beautiful blessing to recover away from all of the grief as a psychic, especially. I think that God had a hand in that. But. Uh, and then you slowly work your way back after that minute. Wow, I'm so glad you had her, and I'm so glad she stepped in like that. That's that's such a biggie, and also to take you away from from all the known um, remembrances. I'm sure that I'm sure that helped. It's like a, a, right. to step out of it. Well, with his death, you were definitely taken into the unknown and unshaped world. If you are comfortable. Um, also, can you share a little bit further past then with that whole month, what, what kind of, um, insights came up through that first month? Did you, did you, was it just all where you were just working your way through it and taking each day as it came? Um, because I had gotten injured, uh, and because I'd had, had hypothermia mm -hmm. and I'd had a coma, at, I was in a coma when I was 14 from a boating accident and it. It caused my brain to be injured again, sort of in a way. And so literally that first month, it was about just trying to get sentences together 
and and trying to get sleep and and so she made sure like that was one of the things the hospital was like you got to get her back on a normal sleep schedule so like we would make sure I went to bed every night at the same time that I got up at the same time and then just getting nutrition and and not doing things too stressful but then I was still because I was a life coach and so many of the friends and family were grieving as well what happened was the Chapel Hill had assigned us a grief counselor and four days into the thing, she collapsed because she couldn't handle the emotions of how much he was loved and the family and the friends. And there was no one left to, to counsel the rest of the people except me. Wow. So for that first, that first, you know, I, we were notifying people and everybody would find out William had passed. They would fall apart. And then I was trying to help them. And then two of my sons were also trying to tell people. And so it was really intense and it was like emotional overload. And, wow. and I was really stabilizing people and doing all the work I normally would do. I went into work. mode. I went into intuitive coaching mode. Um, those first and, few days. And you were able to sleep. Did sleep come okay for you? Uh, well, I didn't sleep at all the first four days. And right. We know that. I just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I think it probably took, about six months, I think, to get wow. sleep back to any kind of normal pattern. Um, and because, you know, one of the things she'd said, the, and love, she was a lovely woman that came from the Chapel Hill Police Department, and she said, you know, you will have nightmares. Mm -hmm. And that is true. You, you, you have a trauma like that, you're going to have nightmares. And, um, and so it, and then because... I'm a fairly organized individual, and I lived in the town that William lived in. And uh, uh, and by the way, everybody called William Will, except me. I always called him William. But all as he became an adult, all of his friends called him Will. So in parentheses, you'll see on the website, like, Will. Uh, and everybody called him Will, except me. I called him William. And he used to kind of roll his eyes at me, like, <laughs> oh, dear, here she goes, doing the mommy thing. You know? And I was big about, it. if I give you a name, why nickname it? And all my kids nicknamed their names. Yeah, That's so like, fun. I can tell from everything that I've gotten to witness of his um, videos and things and projects he's done that he had amazing abilities and you can and just by what you've shared how many people absolutely adored him. Um, so if you want to go because you said there were not necessarily warning signs for you, but that there were warning signs that you learned from others. Um, so what did he share with you and what did he refrain from sharing with you that you learned more about after his death? I think before we go further, I've got to go back into the history of William because okay. otherwise it doesn't make sense for people, if that's okay. That sounds great. Um, so when he was 17 years old, he had to have a patella ligament replacement in his knee from a cadaver. He had blown out that ligament. And he had to have surgery. And so that surgery happened at age 17. And the rehab for that was a year. It was going to take a year to rehab that knee. And the ligament that was donated had a monovirus that piggybacked on the ligament. And that caused his throat to swell. And his tonsils were huge. So his tonsils were actually touching. And they were worried about his ability to breathe. Now, I'm very allergic to prednisone. And William had never had it. And I said to the doctor, I think it's a really bad idea to give William pred prednisone. He says, well, I don't know what else to do. And so they went ahead, they gave him prednisone. And he had an allergic reaction to it, but not right away. Because one of the side effects of prednisone is it causes sleep issues. And he was a straight-A student, and, you know, life was really good. And he started not sleeping, but he didn't tell anybody. And then about 10 days in, he went to hand me a glass of orange juice, and he froze midair. And so he went catatonic because his, they, the doctors determined afterwards his brain had been asleep. His brain had been wide awake for like 10 to 12 days, and he went into a coma because of that. Oh, my goodness. And so, yeah. So when he recovered from that, the doctors gave him two years to live. They said, you know, with this type of, he has a TBI, traumatic brain injury, kind of similar to what Vietnam vets have. And, you know, if he makes it to two years, that'll be good. But the brain is going to eventually fail on it, you know, because of the long-term damage. So so that's kind of the backstory of uh, his brain and, and what was happening. 
And so if the brain gets caught in the feedback, loop, then he would be dead within like 36 hours. He'd get caught in the dopamine feedback loop and, and he, he, the brain, they, the doctor said, if he ever gets caught in that feedback loop again, there's no way we could save him. It would be done. Wow. You know. I mean, you probably learned so much by studying all about this to better understand something like this. I guess I'm curious, why, why did they give him something that had a monovirus? Were they not aware of that? The, the, the donation I'm unaware like, when they uh, scan donations they didn't realize that and that uh, was the idea that the orthopedic thought later was that that's how he got the mono in his opinion he thought it was it had piggybacked on it so these are this is definitely probably your warning signs really just the fact that he had a traumatic brain injury and and just well we knew we knew at some point the brain was going to fail and William had researched his condition dramatically and the whole reason he started the YouTube channel at 19 was because he knew he wouldn't live long. That even if he lived longer than when he hit the two year mark, we had this very powerful conversation of, well, I made it the two years. Now what do I do? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, William, none of us knows how many years or days we're going to have. I don't, none of us knows how long we've got. And he said, well, if I'm not going to have long, then I need a legacy. And, and that was something that was big for William. And, and he, he was a lovely writer and loved to write. And, and his passion was writing. And so he wrote all of those YouTubes that he created and great insights in there. And um, about six months or a year before he died, he had a video. Uh, uh, so most of his channel video insights is like commentaries, his opinions of movies he saw or artists that he liked, things like that. And so there was a film that Orlando Bloom and Liam Nielsen had done about the Knights Hospitaller and during the times of the Knights Templar, and it was called Kingdom of Heaven. And so he created a video called Is He an Angel about this one character in there and was this minor character an angel or not? And all the evidence did seem that way. And so that video went viral and really launched his channel in a big way. And so he did see the channel hit 550,000 views of that video. And it's now at like 850,000 views. And, um, and so the, the, the channel really took off at that point. So he did live long enough to see that, which is, I think, a really good thing. I'm really, really glad he did. And for anybody that's listening to this call, I highly recommend listening to this video. It is, it is beautiful and it's supportive and, um, anybody that listens to it is going to gain from listening to it because it is just for one thing, it's very well done. But for another thing, just the, the topic that he's covering is just, ex right. It, right. it's exquisite for anybody to get to witness. So I, I okay. hope that those listening to this, go ahead and listen to his videos, not just that one, right. but the other ones as well. And, so, and I think it's important to share on the warning signs that a lot of people, there are absolutely none, zero. For, for most people, there are no, I mean, not most, but a lot, maybe at least half, I don't know exactly the statistic, uh, the, the people are private, they're interior, and they do not tell anyone about it. Uh, and, and even, and I don't think anyone knew specifically that he was this way, but that, you know, he had anxiety, he could get edgy. Um, and so, you know, I think that it was more, um, something that he kept kind of, I think on a back burner that he knew, okay, if the, if my brain, if the pain in my brain is too much, I can, I can find the exit window. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's just what happened. Just a byproduct of a, you know, of, of any kind of brain injury, everybody that I've witnessed that's gone through that, exactly what you're describing, you know, the edginess and just disgruntledness at times. I mean, they're, you know, it's definitely a byproduct. So that would make it much more difficult to figure it out. But that's interesting because I haven't, I don't know that much about suicide. And so I haven't heard that before, but it makes a lot of sense that most people go in inside themselves and don't share. Well, I, it's, I'd say it's, you know, part of it is this, the, what I have seen, this is my opinion. So for people that have been affected by suicide, you know, take it with a grain of salt and, and I get it. Trust me, I've walked this road. Um, the people that are trying to get attention will attempt suicide in a way that they can get rescued. Whereas people that are very, very serious will do it in a way that there's no way they're coming back from it. 
And so it, there's really, I think, a line between people that it's a cry for help and people that are really done. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people that attempt it will be successful when they literally, they were just trying mostly to get attention, like, and, and, and you know what I mean? And that I really need help and I can't find a way out. And so, I, and a lot of times, extremely artistic and creative people who have a hard time navigating the world, like Vincent Van Gogh, for example, um, will take that exit ramp when they, when the world just no longer makes sense to them. After COVID, the world made, no longer made sense to William. He could not really navigate the post COVID world. And he just said, he felt like we were losing, like humanity was losing. And, you know, how do I live in a world that's this filled with fear and, He's very empathic, like I was, with yeah. feel emotions. He had, I think, for a lot of young people, we've lost a lot of young people since COVID. Mm-hmm. And yeah. surprisingly, I've, I've the highest rate for suicide in the country is ages ten to twelve. Wow, I haven't heard that. At and all. sit with that for a second. I, I have another client that I have two clients that I've helped help them or help their family members. And one, the girl was twelve years old. And the other, the boy was 11 and they were both bullied at school. And, you know, to lose people that young who don't really still living in the land of magical thinking and, and they don't, they don't really understand that this means they're really going to be dead and gone forever. You wow. know, I really feel like we need to be a lot more supportive of teenagers coming up and we've got to get tough on bullying. I mean, that's something that just needs to, I mean, one of the things that was really hard for me one of the things that actually helped me recover from the grief was i ended up managing his youtube channel mm-hmm. and i started going through the comment section and there were like over five thousand comments on this video and i responded to everyone like that was part of my healing process but out of that five thousand seven hundred were hateful mean wow. nasty wow. horrific some of them terribly bad and I thought, why in the world did he not delete those? And I'm sure reading those would have been painful for him, as empathic as he is. And I went and I deleted all the bad ones. I was like, no, I'm not putting up with that, you know. And wow. uh, one guy had said something nasty, and I responded. And I said, you know, my son has passed away. I thought you would want to know this. This is not a nice thing to say. And he actually responded back, and he said, Ma'am, I'm so sorry for your loss, but I was drunk as could be that night. I I don't even remember doing it. Wow. You know? It's been a journey, and and a lot of it's been really horrible, and picking yourself up is not an easy thing to do. And I feel like you need a purpose or have a something to focus on. I know that people that are successful, maybe they create a foundation um, – you know, of some sort where they do something positive. Like um, one lady I knew, she uh, created a horses, like helping autistic kids. She created a foundation in name of her child. And I've seen, you know, that you need something, I think, to help bring you back. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I agree where you can funnel that, that, that love, basically that love into something that's going to help bring you up and out. Well, so with, with everything that you've you've learned and, and the relationship that you had, did you learn more about your relationship after his passing? Like, were there pieces of it that you just hadn't really um, didn't didn't really understand, but all of a sudden things made more sense to you? Did anything shift like that? Like, what do you mean exactly? I'm not well, sure exactly. like because I think sometimes it, it's interesting how, however, someone is out of our life that when we get our our quiet stillness from it that there's uh, there's like these pieces of your relationship that you hadn't put together that were um did probably more the miracle of what you guys shared like just the greater understanding like like for instance when i got to witness his video and you got to get on and go more more into his videos it's like you you got to witness even more about him that you might not have known even though you knew, knew him a lot as a mother but just pieces of him were was like wow there is so much more depth even that I realized was there something of that yeah I mean there, there was a lot of writings that he had written and and thoughts he put on paper and he had uh, made comments on other YouTube channels so like when I was going through and finding you know 
different things. And then as friends came forward and would tell me their details of their friendship and how William had changed their lives and all of that, that was extremely, um, you know, he was such a kind person and, and, uh, all of his students loved him at the school and, um, you know, and just, you know, dealing with, uh, hearing so much of that, I mean, it takes a toll. You have to step back from it. It's, it's very emotionally overwhelming, I think too. And it was, you know, so positive and, you know, and people were just never would have thought William would have done that. And so, um, I think that was so shocking for people. And then there was such an outpouring of love and affection from, from, you know, his former girlfriends and his current girlfriend and his friends and family members and, you know, all of that. And, you know, I think you have to really make the decision of, you know, an important point to make is that just because a person dies, it does not mean your relationship has ended with that person. That, that soul, that spirit still exists and your relationship changes as time moves on and they are no longer in a physical body, but you are. And with the passage of time, that dynamic changes and how, how you grieve and how you memorialize a person. Uh, sometimes somebody can't touch that grief for a year and they're stoic. And then one day they'll be walking the beach and they burst into tears. So, you know, and, and grief is so personal and everybody grieves differently. I'm not going to tell you how to grieve and that this is the right way to grieve and the wrong way to grieve uh, because it is such a highly charge thing but for parents for, for for the mother and father of a child it's incredibly hard especially fathers and sons is a big thing wow. it's very hard for a father to lose this. um energetically that's the biggest grief on the planet is when a father loses a son wow. There's, I and i don't know if it's just that genetic piece i'm not exactly sure yeah i mean but i but i can i can believe it i can believe it it's like, almost like yeah. losing a part of their manhood or something their maleness or right something. Right. Yeah, yeah. Regardless of how they mm-hmm. What happened then with like work and, and, and just, I mean, your dreams and your strength and all of that. I mean, how long has it taken you to really come back around and through it? It's been two right. years uh, since he died. And, um, you know, there's so many nuances with it. I didn't work for the first year. I just yeah. couldn't do it. And, I was the one chosen by the family to handle the estate. And you would not think a young man's estate would be an event, but it was an event. And it, it was hundreds of items. And and you think you're done, because I kept wanting it to be done. I kept saying, okay, I'm going to make a checklist. And once this last thing is done, then it'll be okay, and I can close the door on it. I got a document a week ago about a very small amount of money. When you're talking about the person in charge of the estate, it, I mean, that's an event. That's going to be a one to two year event that I don't think unless you've ever handled in the States. First time I've done that. I had no clue uh, of, of all the little pieces of the puzzles that would come up. And so like, you know, things like the bank decided that they had illegally charged people and there was like a $12 refund. And so the bank gave, William $12, but they made it payable, like not to me, but to the estate of him. And so you're just like, it's crazy, like how things are worded and what you have to deal with. And it's like, and a year later you can have documents. And like I said, and it was like things that you don't expect. So because of COVID, right. And because I was grieving and I had my little checklist And I had said to the person who had his apartment complex, can you please call the electric company and tell them he's died? I'm in no space to do it. And the apartment manager said, yes, I will. Right. A year later, I did a bill for like a thousand dollars, like twelve hundred dollars in electric bill. Oh, no. And I call the electric company and I say, first of all, my son's deceased. Second of all, this is impossible. And lo and behold, what had happened is the new people that moved in had been getting free electric the entire time because of COVID, because you weren't allowed to turn off anyone's electric. So until the the memoriam on electric stuff was raised, they never got a notice saying they were going to get their power turned off. And that took several hours and phone calls to finally get the 
electric company. I said, I'm not paying a bill for someone who's no longer alive. That's and I didn't get it resolved, but that gives you an example of how traumatic oh, it is. Just something like that. Too much minutia under all those circumstances. Oh, my Isn't God. That wild? Yeah. And, and so, you know, it was really interesting, like, having to get yourself in the mental space to do that. And you couldn't do but so many in a day, like maybe one thing a day. And in the beginning, I really had to deal with things and things you would never think you'd have to deal with, you know. Um, wow. And so, you know, get, get help if you can. Thank God I had a lot of friends that helped me. I had friends come and help me move William's stuff out. Uh, yeah. We put it in storage. Uh, I went around and, and all, everybody wanted something of William's, which I thought was just so sweet. Oh. And uh, and they knew exactly what they wanted, which I thought oh, was amazing. That's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I'd get a call and they'd be like, well, if it's not too much trouble, Mrs. Massingale, you know that blue sweater with the emblem on it? Like, that's the only thing I want. Or someone else would call and say, you know, I used to wash the blanket when William would come stay with my son. Can I, can I have the blanket? Oh. And so then I started gathering items and I dispersed a lot of his stuff, you know, to people that really wanted to have some things and wills. And did, um, did that, that, I mean, that's so heroic and courageous even to do that because it, it kind of keeps bringing you in. But then did it also bring about really nice closure conversations that people got to have with you because they needed that? Yeah, I, I think for them, there was, you know, conversations that needed to be had with people that good for them and good for me and people appreciative that I was willing to do that. And, um, you know, and there was a point where I was done where I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm, that's about what I'm up to doing. And, yeah. Satiated. Yeah. Well, I mean, right. what, what an ambassador, I mean, of all the people yeah. that, you know, he got to have to support him in that way and to support those that, that were left behind. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think another thing to mention that, you know, I don't know how people would feel about it, but you have to go with what's happening in the moment and you've got to do what's right for you, even if people get upset about it. Right. And I decided not to go to the funeral mm. and my oldest son, Matthew decided not to go to the funeral. Wow. And, you know, that was an interesting conversation to have. Okay. And my point of view was pretty simple, which is if I go to the funeral, I will black out cold and pass out and I will be unconscious anyway. And everybody got that. And my ex-husband was wonderful in the sense that I could not do the funeral. I said, I can do the estate after you've got it. I cannot do the funeral because I had fallen apart pretty much. And he said, okay, I'll handle that. You do the estate and hats off to my ex. He did a great job of preparing and doing the funeral and it was a beautiful funeral. And I had friends that went and people told me what it was like and all of that. And then about three months later, I went out to the funeral home and met the director and had, and I sat in, in where they held it and I had him tell me everything Aww. exactly the way it happened. And that was beautiful. That was very like, I knew I needed to do that, but not until I could handle doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, so and so there's no right way to do it. There's no so right way to grieve, you know? So wise, though. I mean, I, it's so neat to, that you tuned into your own self and took that kind of care of yourself because it's just so overwhelming that I'm, I'm, right. I'm grateful that both you and your uh, and your one son did that to take care of yourselves. And neat that to know that you were able to go back into it at the right time and space. Right. Right. Well, so because of your abilities as a medium, um, what kind of connections have you had since it, since he's died? Um, you know, I, I was able to talk to William early on and, and get messages for people. And, um, but in the beginning it was mostly just personal messages Yay. between myself and William. And, um, he, uh, it, it was a very, you know, it's a very interesting and bizarre world sometimes. You know? I bet. And, and so, um, he, wanted to be close to God and he knew he was going home to God. So he drove his car behind a church and did it behind a church. Uh, behind out in the the country. Church. And it was, a, it was a church as fate would have it. It was a church that 
a friend of his used to park behind because she said it was one of the calmest places she'd ever been. Oh, that's neat. And I felt like I had to reach out to the pastor of the church and I couldn't find the pastor, but I found the former pastor of the church and started a relationship or a friendship with that gentleman. And it was an incredibly healing experience. He was there for me for more than a year. Uh, as I found out more information, he wanted to really know know who he was. And I, when I first reached out, I said, if this is too much and you don't want to do it, that's fine. And he went to God on it. He said, I prayed to God. God said, I should do it. I said, okay. Uh, like regular Baptist kind of preacher person. Um, and it just, it led to such a beautiful, you know, healing. And then I got also referred to a man who had started a, um, suicide support group for family members and he he, his wife had died that way and um and connected with him and and then you know it is important to get grief counseling i've I've worked with two different grief counselors one who's one who's a medium and psychologist herself and and then another lady who was certified in grief counseling and um and i didn't do it right away i I was in no shape to do it right away i probably Mm -hmm. waited almost a year and then i i said okay now i can do it and um, I'm, gl- I'm glad that you shared that because I didn't know that. And I, it, it makes so much sense that it's something you have to do. And again, that you took care of yourself and waited till the time was right. And, and it's also neat to see what shows up for you, the, the different people that cross your path, like that pastor that, that are available to you at the right time. I, I really definitely feel like there is a, a divinity that is always, you know, at work with, with that. So do you continue to stay in touch with him now then? Uh, you know, it's changed over time, and, and, and we had some moments where we had really heated conversations about what happened. I mean, we really got into it, and we had times where, you know, it was very apologetic and times when it was just very, you know, mother-son, and now we're in a much better space because I'm dealing with this higher self. I'm not dealing with just the aspect that was William. You know, I'm dealing with the whole oversoul of Will, which is a much wiser, interesting person to have a conversation with in a lot of ways that would be intriguing yeah. and really neat to get to yeah. experience yeah. and uh, yeah. it's really interesting and then you know william has kept an eye on the people he loved and oh. a lot of really beautiful magical things have happened and i have wondered did william have a hand in that you know uh, uh but cool. one of my sons came into a lot of money i came into a decent amount of money within about a year of his passing. And we both looked at each other and said, I think Will's behind this, you know, Uh, and, and from totally unexpected sources and you're like, what? And, and so, you know, I know William's always going to be available, you know, and, and he's going to keep an eye. And and I've seen that with so many, just when I've delivered messages anyway, uh, you know, the spirit family members will keep an eye on family members. They don't, in my opinion, they do not become guardian angels. A lot of people think, oh, my loved one's become a guardian angel. I have not seen that. What I've seen is a loved one is standing next to your guardian angel telling them exactly what's going to happen. Oh, that's life. darling. Like an it overseer. Is. Oh, my yeah, gosh. Like, okay, this is what you're going to do for my mom. Do you hear me? This is what needs to happen. Or this is what you're going to do for my daughter. Do you hear me? This is what's going to happen. Oh, that's And that's precious. more like how they are. Uh, but they're not usually a guardian angel. I have not seen that happen very often. Because watching his video, he felt like he was an angel. I mean, that was what I surmised after listening to it. I thought, I, I, he's know. definitely got angelic. He's, William's got angelic energy, very connected to the angels for sure. Yeah. You know, I, I would definitely put him in the angels ballpark. So with everything, I mean, this is such a fascinating story. Thank you so much for your courage to share it. So health-wise, how, how have you done through all this? Because one of the things I continue to witness is that people do get affected health-wise, either right at the beginning or, or further along. It's like almost like their body can finally say, I get to let down now. How's your health been through all this? Um, I know I've had PTSD, which triggered from childhood. And, and when you have this kind of loss, I mean, noise and lighting became highly problematic for me. I haven't been this noise. I mean, I've always been able to be somewhat sensitive to noise and lighting, but nothing like what happened after William died. Mm -hmm. And so uh, being able to be in crowds is overwhelming. It's like too much data input. Uh, And so that's been a very slow coming back. And part of, you know, I moved to Florida. I relocated 
to where the weather would be more supportive and it's very right. warm here and I'm happy and moved into my cute little tiny home. And, Yay. Um, and, you know, I, 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 there's a lot of power in nature mm-hmm. and nature has a great tremendous ability to pull trauma out of the body. And so, you know, going hiking or swimming or being where you're actually out in nature is extremely restorative. And so, uh, I, I, one of the wisest things I did just sort of randomly really was I decided I was going to travel for a year, but I ended up traveling for seven months. And then I found this house and decided to take a break. Uh, and it forces you back into a routine. You know, I'm in a hotel for three days and I've got to check out to the next Airbnb for two weeks. And it forces you back to life in a way. And Mm -hmm. Ironically, it was probably one of the wisest things I did just as a random thing, not well, realizing how, how much it would help. Well, I mean, I, I, I think it's the same thing you spoke of before with he's right there speaking to your higher aspect. And between the two of them, they're working together to get you back up and out just because of who you are and all that you bring to the table and all that you have to offer. So before we meet um, Aria that you channel, if you're willing to do that, I wanted to just ask if there's anything more you want to include about his, that YouTube that he, that he, uh, that you brought back. Cause you said YouTube had taken it down for a little bit and then you were able to bring it back up. So what happened is, so his website, or not his website, but his YouTube channel, which is his legacy, is called Video Insights. And so he would review movies like Cool Hand Luke was the last video he did, and then Kingdom of Heaven. And then he did art reviews, and he he had an hour-long perspective on social media that's really beautiful that was done before anyone else had done social media. So if people are interested in checking out his his YouTube channel is called Video Insights. And what was really lovely, and I sent you a copy of the memorial video, is my oldest son, Matthew, made a one-minute memorial video of William. And then the other important aspect to share from the channel is I was not prepared for the outpouring of fans and, and loving emails that I got from people that had never met William, but his videos had changed their lives. Wow. And so, like, I got a, a, an email from a man who said, I fought in Afghanistan. Your your son's voice, there's something about it that that's the only way I can get to sleep at night is I listen to William's video and I can go to sleep. And so, you know, there were all of these incredible outpourings of, of how this video changed my life. And, you know, uh, a lot of the videos were watched in Europe and other countries, which was interesting too. And uh, a man from Vietnam said, can I share this on a Vietnamese channel and and so people can see it and i said of course you can and then i when they for copyright infringement they took it down for about eight months the kingdom of heaven video and during that time frame people were contacting me freaking out like you don't understand i need that video back up like i have to have that video and so eventually i'm still not sure whether it was because video because his fans requested it they did put the kingdom of heaven video back up but i hand sent out about 25 copies of it to the fans that wanted it so they'd have their own cop. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful that, that you were able to get it back up and get going again, because I, I, it's one of those where I want to keep going back into it. Cause every time I touch it, it's almost like I, I gain something more that, that it brings forward. So it's, it's one of those that is like a transmission within a transmission. Yeah, I agree with you totally. There is a lot of divine energy in the kingdom of heaven. Mm-hmm. And every time you watch it, I get a different perspective or I'll have an aha. So there is definitely some kind of a, a, a divine mission transmission that's coming through that video uh, and the perspectives that he put in there is really is fascinating. So, yeah, it's so beautiful because he, he it's like he still gets to keep speaking to us, which is so fascinating because I believe there, you know, even though someone's passed over, like you said before, physically, there's still that voice that comes through. So through everything that you've, you've garnered and you've grown so much because of and everything that you've done, do you, do you feel like it wasn't truly a suicide then? Was it, was it really more related to traumatic brain injury that really needs to be, have a greater study? I mean, there's a lot out there now with traumatic brain injuries, but I, I feel like that for, for family members who know that their child did not voluntarily take their life or that their partner or their husband, it is very hard 
because the method is suicide, but what caused that suicide? And I think it has to do with your ability of your brain to make a cognizant decision. Mm -hmm. And if your brain is injured and you are in no capacity to make a decision, then did you really end your life or did your brain injury end your life? And in William's case, the brain injury caused that outcome and the lack of sleep. Whereas there are people who do make a very conscious choice of I'm done here, I'm done on earth and I'm out of here. But that with, as the pressures have been increasing on the planet, more and more people are checking out and it's a lot of times due to too much stress, too much anxiety. And they're just out of here because they can't handle the pressure and they vibrationally are no longer a match and they can't match where the world is currently. And so they're out. So to me, suicide, that term needs to be really reorganized I agree. and changed in some different type of wording uh, because, you know, it, it, that's how it fits. If you would okay. be will willing, my listeners would welcome hearing about and from Aria, the being whom you channel, and what she would be willing to teach and share about her knowledge of grief for our species at this death rebirth time of radical change. Back in 2006, I almost died from celiac, and as a result, um, I went an extended period of time without oxygen, and that jump-started all my psychic abilities. And about a year after that, I had gone to a party uh, my mentor was doing, and there was a, a beautiful portal in this wall. And uh, one of the other ladies that had come to the party was talking about she would love to meet an extraterrestrial or a being from another planet. And her name was Carol. And I said, okay, Carol. And she stood up at this party, and she pointed to the heavens, and she said, hey, any of you friendly ETs that want to come on down and talk to us, you just come on down. We'd love to talk to you. And that's how it all started. And so my mentor that first night, she channeled Arya, A-R-Y-A. And in Persian, that means noble. The word Arya means noble, and O B L E. And so after that first night, Arya said, well, she's not the right match. I need someone that has the right, basically the right brain for it to, to hold the energy and to do it. And because I'd had the coma at 14, a part of my brain, I've been tested at, at the hospitals, and um, a part of my brain is still in a coma and never woke up. Wow. And so Aria comes over that signal. She comes over that signal, and she's able to, to just channel right through. And so channeling is when you bring through information from another consciousness or another being. And, our, and when I do it, I have a very british -y accent. It's very British posh. Your voice always changes when you channel. And she's Arcturian. She's from the Arcturus star system. And uh, she's between 350, 400 years old. She really is like three and a half feet tall, three fingers, three toes, looks the way you think an alien would, except she's what they call a blue Arcturian, that instead of being like a little green alien, she's more like a little blue green alien. And so, uh, you know, regardless of whether you believe it or not, the messages are very divine, fantastic messages. I believe she is who she says she is. So I believe um, it too. And I've, I've written it has, Yeah. Right. And so she's fun to talk to. So you ready? I'll bring her in. I am so ready. Thank you so much. All right. I intend Aria. This is Aria of the Protectorate of Earth these days. It used to be called the Octarian Protectorate. It's not that anymore. Um, well, so I'm just so happy to be on your show, Miss Annie. This is lovely. Well, thank you so much for, for coming through today, and we're excited to just get to hear anything that you can offer that is supportive, if you've gotten to hear the, the interview so far, that is supportive of, I of, have, I have. of anybody that's really recovering through grief, because I actually believe grief is a portal. I think it's a doorway where we really um, can, can grow quite a bit from it. So I just wanted really to hear your processing and thoughts on, on grief. Well, before I talk about it, I need to know what, that's a big word in the sense that it can be defined, oh, hundreds of different ways. So give me your definition of grief before I even go down that ballpark. My definition of grief is uh, where there is some sort of loss. It can cover so many different arenas, like loss of a job, right. loss of someone dear in your life, uh, loss of your identity. Uh, loss, really basically deep, deep loss. And, right. and the process that you go through related to that 
that loss and the doorway and portal that grief opens up for people. So I understand. I understand. So uh, I have a slightly different understanding, but that's all right. But we'll, we'll just see. No, I, that's great. Oh, I, would, I would like to hear what right. your slightly different understanding is. All right. Do you remember a book called The Velveteen Rabbit? Did you ever yes. read it? Yes, way back when. So yeah. it's a little bit like it's a little bit like that. You don't come to Earth and come out of it squeaky clean, where, where you don't have any scars or, or bumps or bruises from being here. You know, it's a hard environment. You have the dichotomy of up, down, darkness, light. You know, there's a lot going on on Earth. It's a very physical planet, a lot of physicality, right? And so, if if you've never experienced fantastically fantastic, beautiful, great love, then you don't have grief. Because grief is a side effect of great love. If if I meet someone and they die and I don't really know that much about them and they're not really a part of my life, I'd be like, oh, that's so sad, whatever, that person's gone. But grief is a very deep, down to your core, down to your DNA, you know. Uh, one of Stephanie's children used to say, people don't love the way you do, Mom. You love with the depth of 10,000 oceans. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a person who loves with the depth of 10,000 oceans, guess how they grieve with the depth of 10,000 oceans. And so it's the flip side of loving someone and then they leave your life. And usually, you know, none of us are really, even if you know someone's dying, it's still an unexpected thing when you actually hear they're gone. You know, even if you knew they, they only had days, you still are not prepared. You really are not. And and that's genetic. It's down to the core, you know. So and that's part think, of love. Do you believe grief is also connected to, like, I mean, there are, like, I heard one, an instance recently where somebody was an accountant during COVID and he lost his job. And then he lost two other accounting jobs in two years, or within the two years. So he lost three jobs related to that. So you're ascribing it to love, but do you think it also can be related to um, you know, like loss of job, loss of identity. It, it depends because if he really loved those careers and loved that job, then he might have a tremendous grief. If he hated that job, he might have tremendous relief. Like, oh True. my goodness, I can go do something else. True. But that you can love a job, you can love a dog. You know, it, it's linked to this concept of love. love. Okay. And, and having something either removed either forcibly removed from you or it's just removed and you want prepared and, and it's about letting go too you know grief mm -hmm. grief changes when you let go and some people can't some people it's too hard to let go they don't know how to let go you don't have to let go there's no edict from god saying you have to let go of your grief you can hold on to it your whole life if you want you know and so it is an interesting journey. I believe you learn a lot about yourself. That's your portal right there uh, through the grief process. You, you get changed by it. You're never going to be who you were before. That's I'm not going to happen. That's what everybody says. It's like they wake up. The, the, the words are, I wake up as an or, in my ordinary day. And then literally whatever the grief is connected to, you're, sure. you're, it's never the same. Yeah. No, and Stephanie, for a while in the beginning, she kept trying to get back to who she was before. And I said, sweetheart, that's never going to happen. You can't ever get back to who you were, how you ran your business. Her, how she runs her life is completely different. The types of clients she's attracting now are different. You know, her business changed dramatically because of it. Uh, she stepped away for a year, so she lost a lot of clients as a side effect. It took time. It's taking her time to rebuild the business, and it's a different type of clientele. Mm -hmm. uh, who she is has changed dramatically, you know. Uh, it, it is a very revealing thing. And it's just part of the process of living on this planet. We are in global trauma. Mm. There are beings trying to create situations to keep people in traumatic events. Mm -hmm. the grief can be a side effect of that. But you have to have time after the event to grieve. If you just remain in trauma and the next trauma and the next trauma and the next trauma, there's no period for you to grieve. And there's a lot of dark energies on this planet that are trying to keep people stuck in trauma, not allowing them the grief process so they can heal and come out the other side. And so, we've got to change our relationship with trauma, first of all. And, 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 and that makes sense to people. And how and what and just as your thoughts on changing our relationship to, to trauma, what, what would that look like? 
All right. So um, you've got to change how you respond to stress on a daily basis because it, it, it does add up over time. It's like putting little holes in a tire and a little bit of air leaks out. But if you've got a thousand holes, you're going to have a flat tire really fast, you know, like little pinpricks, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, uh, Stephanie's son, William, used to talk about he felt like, you know, life was death by a thousand cuts. You've heard that saying, death by a thousand cuts. And Stephanie used to respond, no, let's focus on life by 1,000 repairs. Oh. And I've always thought that is the way to go, that you need community. Being alone is not going to cut it going forward. We need each other. I agree. More than ever. Got, more than ever. You know, you've got to get back to community. Even if it's Zoom online community, that's better than not in person or not having it at all. Volunteer. Go connect with people. Go help people. Mm -hmm. Get in the world. Change. Move yourself out of powerlessness into power. Right? Trauma is I'm frozen. Well, you can fight, flight, or flee. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, this kind of trauma tends to freeze people up. It, they, they don't tend to run away and they don't tend to fight back. They just tend to be frozen, really. Um, so you've got to claim your own life back and find meaning and purpose and joy because Earth is a beautiful place. There is oh. love. And joy oh. And, oh my gosh, the food alone is worth the trip, right? Oh, and, the, and the nature. I, I, I just got to be in a beautiful walk right. near the Biltmore, and it was absolutely so beautiful and stunning. All the trees. Yes. Biltmore is lo lovely. And, oh. you know, and then grief from my species is very different from you. We grieve differently. We, we have yeah. a different approach than you do. Can you share that? Because I would love to hear how that is different. I can. I can. You know, um, a death for us, because we're long-lived, first of all. So we live a lot longer than you do. And a lot of species live thousands of years. Right. So, you know, you've pretty much had enough time to do everything you wanted to do by the time you transition. Most advanced species don't have death and illness. I mean, don't have illness the way you do or injuries the way you do. It, it's much more advanced medical. So death is more of a almost always only when you're extremely old as a natural cessation of life mm -hmm. versus something that ended your life. See, isn't that different? So, a so natural for, cessation. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's it's a right relationship with it. So, when when right. uh, someone passes, like when when you've lost someone, um, so have you been able to to move with it then with much more ease and grace? Like when you, uh, like, grace, maybe ease, not so much. So I'm an identical twin. I have a twin whose name was Aria, A R I A, and she died about three four years ago. Uh, and you know that's your identical twin right so yeah. uh she had an illness which uh, but she was near you know older and so it was an illness that is known in the elderly Arcturians and so she could have done more honestly to have lived long there were techniques she could have done and she sort of made the decision no I'm gonna let this take its natural course I'm fine leaving you know and, and so then, that brings up an interesting concept yeah. of death suicide and all of that right in what way well when do you intervene when do you attempt to lengthen your life and when do you just say i'm going to let nature take its course right. in your society when do we how often does someone get something like a cancer and say you know i'm just going to let god and nature take its course i'm not doing chemo i'm not going to have any extraordinary measures i'll, I'll do what i can but I've made this decision that I'm going to let it play out. However, think about that. I mean, it's an interesting choice to make. I think. Oh, I love it. I love it. It's all, it, again, it's still right relationships. And I, and I've seen people, you know, have miracles show up that they would least expect where there is some anecdote that, that shifts whatever they're dealing with and in ways they would have least expected. And I do believe a lot of that is attitude. And, and a lot of it is changing diet and exercise and all of true, that. Stephanie had true. a client with stage stage four cancer. They gave her, I think, like three months to live, and she became macrobiotic diet mm -hmm. and alive 15 years later. And she actually had gone back and told the doctor later, you know, look, here I am, you know. That's um, so, you know but you could have another person do the exact same thing, mm -hmm. macrobiotic diet, and they don't make it. And so, you know, it's not a one size fits all because people are dealing with their karma, their past lives that are in play. 
you know, and that's a very intriguing exploration of how a previous life impacts this one and also it impacts how you exit. Well, I've also had people here on, on, in 3D discuss that there people have life contracts. So it doesn't matter if, if your contract was for X amount of years, then in your contracts done, then you're going to go. It just, you know, how you go, to, you know, it, it is less important that just that your contract is up. Is that, is that true or false? Neither. You can have a life, everyone has a life contract, you can, that's true. And let's say your life contract is for 83, you're going to live to be 83. Okay. Right? But you happen to be at 9-11 during the 9-11 event, and you get caught up in that collective consciousness and you're uh, 40 years old, then what will happen is if you die in an unexpected collective event that you couldn't get out of because the collective energy sucked you in, mm-hmm then you will be reincarnated right away or you get you know and people that loved you would get replacement contracts and other people come in and take over the lessons you would have learned for example that can happen uh, and then you always have exit windows you have about seven of those in any life and if it's too much at an exit window God's fine you can be like all right you want out you know car accident or whatever happens and you're right. out. And people, sometimes they just die in their sleep. That's a big one that's happening these days is that someone will walk in the room and the person's just mm-hmm. gone. I am hearing that. Their consciousness is just ready to go. And so, you know, Earth is definitely not a one-size-fits-all place. It's no. very individualized. Um, I, I, you know, Americans especially, they like to try to put everybody in the same three or four categories, and it just does not Mm-mm. work that way at all. And say, so what's my mission? My mission is evolution of consciousness. Yay. I'm going to help you evolve. I care about where you start and where you end up. I don't care about, you know, how you got there. You know, I'm really looking at where you started and where you ended up. It doesn't matter to me. If you, if you only raise your consciousness 10 points, that's fine. You know, if you go 300 points, that's even better. But it's very interesting to watch what's happening on Earth for everyone. And so... You know, grief is part of what you need for transformation, correct? Mm-hmm. So right. you've had a trauma, you need to be allowed to grieve, and then it transforms into something new and beautiful. And so that's where we're getting stuck on Earth right now, is we're not hitting the transformation piece. We're, we're doing the trauma really well, we're doing the grief really well, some of, some people. But we've got to hit transformation, you know. Yeah. And so is, is your greatest recommendation where people start going out in community and start being of service and, and really, really taking their identification, like I said before, off me and more into we, because we're a species, we're a whole beautiful, wonderful species. And well, we-, well we, we are, and, and that's part of your problem with a, is this. <laughs> I'm an Octarian, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not say, you know, I am from, you know, Gainesville, Florida. You know, I, I, you know, you're so subdivided. You've got over what 200 countries, and you've mm-hmm. got, you know, oh, I'm an African, and I'm a Russian, and I'm a North Korean, and you've got all these identifications that True. separate you. And so, you know, the whole point of COVID is that it was a unifying factor. Mm-hmm. That COVID was meant to be the first thing to affect all humanity on the planet, and that it would unite you as a species. Not that we created uh... it, we created by other beings. But there was an opportunity there, mm-hmm. right? And now that opportunity is moving over to the environment that, okay, you're not unifying as a species. Well, maybe if you have so many environmental issues on the planet that you mm-hmm. are forced together to, to work together, maybe that will happen. And so a lot of these young ones are, are coming in, really watching their diet and health and eating <laughs> healthy. And, you know, a lot of these millennials have got it spot on, you know, and they're changing the, the relationships of how they partner with one another. And they really are coming in with a completely different attitude. A lot of them. That's great. I, I, I can, I can see that working. And I'm also seeing, aren't there a lot of ch- young children that are coming in that haven't even been here before? A lot of people coming in from other places. Yes. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So it's beautiful. And let's think more about your audience for a minute. Let's look at, someone's listening to this and they've recently lost a loved one and they're in tremendous grief, you know, and, and what do we do with that energy? What do we do with that grief that they're dealing with, you know? And I have found that grief is better shared. 
Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting with it all by yourself, it just turns into a ball inside your body and doesn't help at all. And it can really cause damage. But if you call up your friend, Annie, and you say, you know, I'm just having a day. I'm missing William, you know, or something like that. Then that releases it and it leads to a conversation or you're there for friends, you know, or you say, you know, um, I, 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 you know, what are the interests you have? Like, I, I love gardening, so I'm going to join gardening groups. It is about getting back into community and finding a way to be there. Now, some people do need to, like, be alone for a while to really process. Yeah. But at some point, you got to get back to the art of living, you know, um, and finding uh, resources that work for you, you know, whether that's therapy or, or you're reading great books. Like, wasn't the book you, you mentioned, the Sorrow book? What was the like Wild the Edge of book? Sorrow. It's beautiful. I'm coming across that, such, be such beautiful books. And they're all by people that have really worked through their grief. And then this is their next step stage that they take on, which is like what you're talking about, where you go out and do greater projects and put those exactly. energies. Because there's so much beautiful energy that I'm sure is accreted um, because of everything, the depth of, of emotional um waves that people go through that it you know when it's funneled into something that's really because we're master creators i believe so to to put it into some sort of creative format is exquisite right and you know that's very important and then the death process and the legacy thing mm -hmm. you know death is an interesting thing and in your culture you don't deal with it well how, how we bury people or cremate people or who gets the ashes or who argues about who gets the money from the will, or, you know, I mean, the whole death process has really been messed with in, in modern culture. And you've really got to get back to a more natural experience of transitioning and having more of a belief system that's supportive of what happens after here. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. You, you well, need to have something to support you as you transition out of here. And so that's interesting because in the old days, you know, death was a natural part of life. And these days, many young people have never seen anyone die, have never experienced it, so that when it does show up, it just completely freaks them out. You know, well, they don't just, have all these relatives and things like that. And just even, yeah, the beautiful ceremonies that have been done by so many different cultures throughout time. Like for 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 your, for the Arcturians, how do you... Um, how do you, how, what kind of completion ceremony takes place when someone passes over within your, your species? That's a great question. Uh, so we do a, it's called a four hour life review. Uh, and, and so we know four hours from when we're going to be dead. Wow. And so the families come and you're very conscious in Octarian cultures. Even if you have an illness, they have a way to, make it that you can be totally yourself and you get this last four hours with the family uh, and the family's there when you transition and it's it's like a four-hour family review that's beautiful you know? that's fabulous yeah, it's, it's, and mean, it's very uh you know very big deal in my culture it's very uh, uh sacred Yes, yes. And that's yeah. what I'm saying, that sacred ceremony, because I, I, I actually did take a beautiful course called Reclaiming Wisdom that really taught about all the dis different components that you're speaking of that that people can have in preparation. And then whatever they choose, it, it even asks you to make three wishes. Like, how beautiful is that when you're right. upset? mind that you're getting to ask for all those things that you would wish for under those circumstances like the one person that i'm gonna um sit for she wants to be in, in uh there present for three days afterwards and and she'll give me a list of music and flowers and people can come and eat food and celebrate and so i you know i love i love that idea and i'm, I'm grateful that she asked, yeah. yeah that she asked me to be a part of it so that's beautiful now, before I go today, because I know you're going to do some cards for Stephanie. I'm I am. I am. Any last thoughts before I leave and bring her back? No, it's, it's actually been really, really supportive for you to come in and bring this. Because uh, I, I guess I hadn't really looked at 
the fact that the trauma is so pervasive that we just keep getting re-traumatized and re-traumatized. So it was really helpful for you to bring that kind of clarity to it, because I think it's really insightful right now and really important for people to understand that piece of it. And I also believe it's also holding back people from even getting to do any kind of grieving because they're just in, in reaction exactly. to this creation. Right. So. And that's why you've got to hit the pause button and do the grief process and stop the trauma. And you, sometimes you have to step away from people and say, you know, that's why news, I recommend no one ever do the news because it's re, it's underlyingly traumatizing everybody. You don't oh. want you, you to, you don't need to know everything that's happening in the world. You really don't. Right. You need to know what's happening in your world. You need to know what's happening in your world. Mm -hmm. uh, but not necessarily everybody else because that's not your concern. You know, that's their concern. Yeah. And so it's overwhelming. Your brain can't hold on to that many pieces of information, first of all. Just the information overload alone is stressful. Too much I, data. All I, right, I'm going to count myself out. And thank you so much. And I, I love the outfit. The outfit's beautiful. For those of you who can't see it, she's got on a beautiful pink outfit. Uh, and I love thank you. Pink. Lovely. All thank right, let me do count out thing. Give me a minute because i got to really get it back. Thank you so, so, so much. That was great. I'm really grateful that she got to meet the audience and that the audience gets to witness all that she brings to the table. And it's very helpful. It's it's a nice, Good. different perspective that um, will, I think, be very well received. And I'm grateful that it was a part of this interview. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited for the next part because I don't know what I know, we're doing. This is so very fun. Exciting. So I know because you're usually the one that does it for so many other people. So the cards that I picked was an Oracle deck and it's called the 13 moon Oracle deck. And, um, and I, it was really fun to see, I did six questions for you and it was fun to see what showed up and, and how it pertains to what has been shared today. So the very first question has to do with who is trying to connect. And it's so interesting because my, my 3d mind wanted to say, Oh, it's, you know, it's, it's will or whatever, or an angel or something like that. And what came through was, um, the Oracle for the frequency of violet. So it was actually the violet flame and the color of violet, which um, uh, the card recommends that it's about transcending. So um, what I what I uh, surmised through this was freeing the radiance of yourself. This violet divine frequency calls you through inward focus to for forgive yourself and others. You are being asked to sensitize your perceptions in the ways you relate to others. You can now spiritually employ the power of your inner knowing to validate your true essence. I really believe you on some level know this, but it's always good to hear it. Subtle cues are being offered around you as you continue to refine this diamond awareness. And I love the part that came through about diamond awareness, because I think there is a beautiful refinement that is going on within you as I see you up level now and spiral up and out of everything that you've witnessed for the last two years. The, fi the violet flame is present to clean up old beliefs around your value and worthiness as it polishes your compassion compass towards yourself, especially. And what came through was that a Herkimer diamond crystal is coming your way. Um, so I think that'll be okay. interesting. I know I love Herkimer diamond. Oh my gosh, I love the frequency of those. So it felt, it felt really perfect for it to be the violet flame and connecting to the Herkimer uh, diamond crystal. Um, and if you have any questions, just, you know, let me know or anything. Oh, I will. I will. Okay, you're so great. Thank you. Um, so what are you trying to connect to now? And this is this was the oracle for the frequency of purple. So it's interesting that you're having such beautiful colors come to you. But in this case, purple has to do more with challenge, which is also about showing up. I definitely, just from my exposure and crossings with you, I am witnessing how you are really starting to show up more and more back into life and in a newer and, and more like a Herkimer diamond, truthfully. Um, so you're being called to bring the depth of your life experience to navigate the frequency of this initiatory gateway you are in. Have you ever looked at it as, as you're kind of in a new initi initiation now that you're going through? Yeah, I definitely feel, yeah, definitely feel my consciousness has taken a higher level jump for sure. 
Yeah, I definitely see it spiral. I mean, I do get the spiraling up. You have already witnessed yeah. prior challenges and growth rings, which I love how that came through, to be standing at this gate. You are being asked to stop and witness how far you have progressed. They are saying to offer yourself the purple heart. I love that. Purple's coming up all over the place. I know, but a purple heart. Do you deserve a purple heart with everything that you, you've come through and, and, and the up level? I would say yes. Yes, say, yeah, yes. Yeah. So yeah, you just might have to do a little purple heart and put it, and either put it with scotch tape or something on your on your blouse. I would think that would be precious. That uh, is, that is. So what shimmery is what lives at the heart of the challenge for you, which is grace. Purple offers a deep, rich, and vibrant feeling tone. Using purple in your attire, environment, and meditations is supportive at this time. This color frequency is urging you into greater momentum as you embody a more expansive perspective. You are being guided to show up mood moving out of the background into joyous, authentic expression, like doing a cannonball jump into a pool with a nice big splash. I just think that's so great. You're gonna wear your purple heart and you're like, you're like, you're really going out there and your energy is so vibrant, Stephanie. It's it's absolutely so so love based that my experience is where wherever you whoever you touch whatever you touch you know it it expands there's no way it can't because of you're coming from such a place of integrity and wholeness it's it's great um let's see what else this color frequency is urging you into greater momentum as you embody a more expansive perspective you are being guided to that all right so the third question is what is your message and it's um the oracle of the sacred tools of mantra yantra and mudra structure do you ever do anything with with uh, mudras or anything like that i haven't much no not really okay i'm familiar with them i've done much right before. right I, i've done some uh stained glass mosaics that are are uh uh, mantras and mudras. Um, so your message is to distill, penetrate, and expand. You are ready and ready to dig deeper into the surface appearance of your life to better divine its underlying structure. Seen through your heightened lens, how sacred tools and symbology present themselves in you to ignite your perspectives of the world and a more amplified soul self meaning do you pay attention to any kind of sacred tools or any kind of sim symbols that are around you uh yeah i, I keep track of all that okay i, I would figure you would these yeah. tools can um, I for me trinity i mean trinity and the number three is a big one that shows up for me all the time that's interesting. It'll be, it'll be fun to see what, what symbols start to show up now, because I just, I believe this, I just felt from, from, especially with this card that you, right, really, right. you're going to be spoken to in many more ways with this, the subtle subtlety. Um, you are being christened with, christened with your sacred tools to process and integrate states of consciousness, which exist beyond the range of human language which I, you're already so telepathic to me. They can assist you in distilling vast information now coming to you. Are you starting to get a lot more downloads? Well, yeah, but you know. You always do. Well, yeah, so so, so this is like, I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about because you know you do this, right? So this right. is familiar. So that's a download, right? And so you get that, but it's outside of English because English is a very limited language. So, yes, I have been getting more of what's called light language or downloads, yes. Yay, 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 yay. I love light yeah. language. Um, they can assist you in distilling vast information now coming to you. You are being asked to surmise the larger picture to seemingly unrelated experiences, which are steering you closer to more expanded panorama of yourself. So there must be aspects of you calling for change right now that carry the capacity to expand and transmute, it's like you're sending out the the bugle call. When, but but oh, with, that's cool. that's but with your cool. pur with your purple heart and with your purple attire. So um, there are structural energetic form behind the form manifested in physical reality and can be called 
life models, images, and ideals. And when I tune into the life models, it the sensing I'm getting is that there actually are going to be some curriculums that you are going to be bringing forward related to um, really a lot of what we discussed today. It's almost like this was a preamble to uh, what 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 may be coming forward for you to bring forward for people, most especially related to even understanding grief, you know, trauma and grief. I think those were those are big topics. Yeah, they definitely are. They definitely are. Okay. So this definitely feels like a, a, a rebirth process to me. So the fourth question is, what do you need to be aware of positives and difficulties? And uh, the Oracle card that came through was the Oracle of the sacred tool of the crystal skull, which is about focus. And it's also about magnifying, amplifying, activating and transforming. So it is important currently to clearly focus returning yourself back to the center of your being. Essentially, you are choosing to take the driver's seat from your ego mind and give it back to your expanded essence coming back to the present in magnifying your clear mindedness your sharpened focus becomes transformative a win-win what is manifesting around you in your world shows up as your chosen focus which we all know what you focus on expands um, your divine architecture is calling calling is to be a transformational gift in this spiraling up world of luminescence clear unobstructed awareness which will be your focus of choice which i mean the, the luminescence is definitely um as as it, as it said before is much more shimmery um so there, it's almost like you're expanding out brighter and brighter and 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 sending that uh what i would almost call like a a beautiful uh well, it's not a flashlight it's a bigger light than that but that it's it's you you really are sending that light out in a in a much more pronounced like way. Like, yeah, yes, yeah, that's it. Flood thought I was trying to get it and I couldn't pull it up. Um, in a, in a, yeah, in a much more expanded way. And it's, it's, it's time. It's basically time. So, how can you be more aware of spirit? Um, the card that came up was the oracle for the frequency of sapphire blue, which has to do with equanimity. So oh. you've had the violet, you've had the purple, and now you've have it, had the sapphire blue. And I think that's really, that's really. Uh, a nice combination of colors that are coming in as the oracles for for today's reading. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so this yeah, is, that is beautiful. I know it's really it's neat to see where that's how that's going to show up. I feel like that's going to be part of your subtle cues. So there's um, this has to do the equanimity has to do with meditative, peaceful, still, silent, inward, mysterious and detached. So this is interesting. This is taking you more in again. So to be more aware of spirit, you can submerge yourself into your deep well, mysterious watery depths for remembering and rediscovering your equanimity. You can also refine your peace residing within your inner focus and meditation. Do you meditate very much? Do you, are you a meditator? You know, um, my life is a meditation. So for me, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. always in a meditative state. So that's kind of a hard question. So no, but that's uh, do I do formal meditation sometimes, but it, and because I've I've just done this work for so long, I'm always in altered state. So right, kind of, right, okay. Um, so that's that's a great response. I mean, that's a that's nice for other people to get to hear that meditation doesn't just look like <laughs> a tiny little uh, identifier tag that so many people give it. So equanimity signifies moving like water to flow, cool for a bit, redirect, and then change states. I like that. So it's the yeah. To, to flow and then stop and cool for a little bit and then redirect its, its flow of where it's going and then change states. With the overwhelm of sometimes frantic focus going on in this external world, the stillness and silence will reintegrate your richness of the human experience. Surrender to the silent, empty canvas on which you can consciously create. And I'll be so, it'll be so interesting to hear what you share related i mean I, I already see you doing this but it's interesting to see what your blank canvas um will bring forward you know with with what they're discussing here anyway um well, part, well, part of that for me just to jump in here for a second is you know i am going to start the youtube channel called everything metaphysical as part, partially because william did the channel 
and it was his legacy. And so that kind of inspired me to like, well, maybe I need to get information out there to people as well. So despite my lack of technology tools, we are going to do it anyway. But the, I guess the one thing that I can share with you on that is that you yeah. kind of, if you build it, they will come. It's like that there's so much and, and everything, believe it or not, even though it doesn't seem like it, I think it's going to get easier and easier for all of us. So it's not going to be quite as uh, tr- tough from a technical version. I mean, it, 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 it's getting, there's, they're make, they're trying to make things better because that's the way our world's going. It is easier. It is easier. So yeah, that's, good. I'm, that's so exciting I, that, I, you know, right definitely like to hear more and and once you get um your first one up let us know we can add it to this video down below I'll it. Um, besides everything about else, a month I'm, I'm gonna launch it in about a month probably by the first of april is the plan. everything metaphysical i love it that's beautiful i'm so excited i'm excited um for everybody that will be touched by what you bring forward so thank thank you thank you for for being of service in that way that's like um very exciting to hear so your last one, I love this, is how will this enhance your spiritual growth in the future? And this is so perfect for you. It was an oracle for the archetype of the wise woman. I would oh, totally... well, you know, that is the best. <laughs> That's totally yeah. you. You're such a good wise woman. And it's about I simplify and I resonate. This will enhance your spiritual growth to further discover the wisdom of your own wise woman who perceives truth directly through heart knowing to further become present with the bi- bigger mythic story knocking on your door, welcoming friends who wish to create together, ready to laugh in the wisdom of the present and play with your mythic cosmic collective here for you, embodying your wisdom less through advising and talking and more in listening and becoming full, being fully present and complete loving receptivity is key so it's about allowance which is really a lot of what um aria was talking about allowance and inclusivity um where where people come together more right. in community so opening allow and allowing for new input new people new possibilities hidden within the realm of deep listening and stillness and I can speak for myself with doing this podcast. It'll be fun to hear how it progresses for you because it, it's got its own lifeline. So once you once you create the opening for it to happen, it's going to be really neat to see who who you bring forward to share an interview and what topics you bring forward to discuss. And it it does have its own um, kind of birthing. It just come. It, it's just fun to see what what comes through. Um, so seeing through the eyes of your wisdom, your life experience, and that of everyone around you is truly serving growth, a biggie for someone like yourself recovering through grief of such magnitude. And one of the neat things I like about this last piece is that today is your birthday. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a celebration where you're going to be bringing together community and um, all of us get to celebrate that we, that we have uh, cross paths and get to share uh, your beautiful spiritual love and divine heart. So I'm excited. Yeah. And I so, really wanted to share because this is so important to the listeners and to women in general that do not know this, but in the Native American culture, the day you turn 60, when you become 60 years old, which is my birthday today, you are then considered a wisdom keeper or a wise woman, which is perfect. today for the rest of your life. And then it's your job to pass on that knowledge to the next generations coming up. I love it. Well, I can just speak for yeah. myself. And the, the decade of the 60s is absolutely the most beautiful decade to get to live through because we're we are in such a different place with our with our wisdom and and life experience right. that right. it's just you, you everything seems to come together and coalesce into such beautiful elder shares because we are elders. Exactly. And there's there's not as much reverence for elders as there there can be and was in other species. So I'm hoping right, that, right. that that blossoms. So in closing with my new association and crossings with you, Stephanie and Aria, I have witnessed both of you carrying into the world such precious, precious gifts to humanity. These include your your both of your reverence for all life your authenticity, and at times, a slight whisper from the original divine cadence of your souls. It has been a blessing, a blessing today, thank you, to share with you both. Thank you so much for the rich richness of your being that's present here today, and thank you for being able to celebrate your birthday in this way, and also to 
pay tribute to your beautiful, beautiful son, Will. So well, thank you for having me on. And when I get the channel up and running, you're going to be on as a guest. So it'll be Oh, yay. Fun. Oh, beautiful. Thank you very, very much. It has been a pleasure. And I look forward to celebrating further with your birthday. Thank, thank you. you. Sweet.